Hey guys, it's your Peacekeeper coming at you with a video that you guys have requested many, many times, and that is armor profiles and what do they mean? And I can, I've heard you ask multiple times, you know, hey, Peace, I, I know that you're, you're saying all these interesting things about turtleback armor schemes or all or nothing armor schemes, but I'll be honest, I have no idea what you're talking about. Can you please explain it to me? Well, that's the purpose of this video. In this video, we are not going to talk about the merits of individual types of armor, but their overall layout. So we're not going to cover what Vickers Hardened Steel is, or what Krupp Steel is, or, or STS, or Class A, or Class B. We're not covering that in this. We are simply talking about how armor is laid out on a ship. And we are going to start off by talking about belt armor layouts. And belt armor is the vertical armor that protects the sides of a ship. And there's two of the most, the two most common ways to do this are going to be the incremental armor design and the all or nothing armor design. Let's start with incremental armor design. The incremental armor design is basically we're going to take our armor and we're going to cover the ship from tip to stern. So we're going to cover it all the way from the very front of the ship all the way to the very back of the ship with armor on its armor belt. And we are here in the armor viewer looking at the grosser cur first, and we can see its incremental armor design here for its belt armor, where we start off at 60 millimeters in the front, it steps up to 120, then to 380, then steps back down to 120, and then down to 32 at the aft end. And the reason why this was chosen was is it protects more of the ship with armor, but in earlier ships that are subject to naval treaties, not like the Grosser Kerr first was ever built, but had she been built, she wouldn't have been subjected to any naval treaties on displacement limitations. But on other ships that were, the incremental armor design actually provided less protection than the all-or-nothing armor scheme did because we had to spread out our armor from, you know, the tip of the ship to the stern. So we don't have as much armor over those critical components, but there's more armor over more of the ship. So more of the ship was, in theory anyway, more survivable. This was the standard in armor design for actually quite a long time, and it, it wouldn't be until the Americans popularized the all-or-nothing armor design that we started to see nations change away from the incremental armor design. So let's talk about that all-or-nothing armor design. We're going to pull up the Montana because it shows this really well. The all-or-nothing armor design was originally actually developed by the British. In fact, HMS Inflexible, which was an ironclad battleship, was the first ship to have this armor scheme in 1876. However, it would be the United States that would choose this as the standard for their battleship, starting with the U.S. standards, the Nevada and Oklahoma in 1912, and then all the way up until... They stopped making battleships in the, you know, early 1930s and 1940s. Sorry, early 1940s, late 1930s. The all-or-nothing armor scheme is literally as it sounds. We are going to place our armor, all of it, over the critical components. If it is not a critical component, it gets, quote, nothing in terms of armor. That's not to say that there isn't any armor there. It's just that the armor isn't thick enough at those locations to really qualify as being an armored section of the ship. If we look at the Montana here, you can see that the belt armor is 409 millimeters thick. Now that's thicker than the Grosser Kerfurst's belt armor. And we'll get to talking about the internal structures of, of Grosser Kerfurst in a minute. But the belt armor itself is thicker. But if we look at the bow and the stern, it's only 32 millimeters. And it's 32 millimeters for all of it. So... The only place that there's any belt armor is here all the way out at the edge and over the vital machinery spaces. This created what was known as the floating raft and, and the armored citadel uh, that was basically this armored box that contains all of the fighting components of a ship and all the critical components of a ship. If it wasn't a critical component, remember, it didn't get any armor. And this design actually puts more armor over the vital components than the in incremental design did, and as a result, this actually provided better protection for the combat systems of a ship, and if you were outside that armor box, well, <laughs> sorry, you know, you, you weren't deemed mission critical and therefore weren't terribly important. 
I also do want to take a time to, you know, just a brief time to explain the differences between internal and external belts. Uh, some ships did incorporate an internal belt structure. The two easiest to identify ships with this are going to be the South Dakota class and the Iowa class battleships. If we click on Missouri, which is an Iowa class battleship, you can see the armor profile. It's like, oh my goodness, it has no armor at all. No, that's not true. It does have armor. It, oop, it, it is currently hiding underneath the hull plating. And this internal belt actually has a number of advantages. But it, it came about for the South Dakota and the Iowa classes because the width limitations for the Panama Canal. In order to get these ships through the Panama Canal, we can only make them so wide. In fact, the Missouri's, I believe it's a foot <laughs> narrower than the Panama Canal. So they have six inches to work with on either side to negotiate the, the canals there. Um, so not a whole lot of room to put armor plating on the outside. And this internal belt allowed them to actually use less total armor because it's inclined very heavily. In fact, on the South Dakotas and the Iowas, it's 19 degrees. And while it is thinner at only 12.1 inches of actual class A armor, it actually has more protection than a straight vertical belt would. In fact, 17.3 inches is the comparable thickness of a vertical belt for that 12.1 inch belt plate. So we know from this design that we actually have a lot of protection even though the actual raw armor thickness itself doesn't seem like we do. And that's because that internal belt is heavily inclined so you get a thicker effective thickness when a shell impacts it. The external belts, you know, you can see them on a number of ships. Here's Montana with the, the its external belt. There are some advantages to an external belt, mostly in the fact that it's easier to replace the imaged armor plates. The internal ones obviously are very difficult because you literally have to cut away the hull of the ship in order to replace the belts or cut away the, the you know, the, the decking. Speaking of decking, let's talk about the different ways that we can actually armor our deck. And to do so, this first one, we are going to pull up the Bogatir. And the Bogatir is part of what is called the Protected Cruiser style of deck armoring. Now, this top deck is not what we're talking about. That's frequently called a weather deck, and the, the name is exactly as it implies. It's intended only for keeping the elements out of the ship. But what makes it a Protected Cruiser here is you can see that we have this internal sloped deck armor. And... This has a number of advantages, and, and in, in this game, they are very well laid out for close quarters engagements. And the Bogatir herself, maybe not so much, but what makes a protected cruiser different from a turtleback armor scheme is that there is no external belt. And we'll talk about turtlebacks here in just a minute. But the, the Bogatir, if we pull up its outer hole... Yeah, you can see that its plating thickness is basically non-existent. But if we go back to, you know, this view, you can see that there is armor and it is covering only the machinery spaces and the magazines and conning tower of the ship. And this provides a lot of really good protection for those machinery spaces to those close range engagements because incoming fire at close ranges is coming in more close to horizontal and it's very difficult to penetrate these flat but angled plates. Now, if, if the machinery spaces were just protected by vertical belt armor, we would be able to penetrate that with relative ease. But because the, of the internal sloped deck armor, that shell has to penetrate through that sloped deck armor. In this case, 70 millimeters on the Bogatir. And it's very difficult to do that. And that made these ships really, really, really tough in the close engagements that the ships like the Bogatir were actually involved in, which were, took place at close ranges. And all of the nations of the North Atlantic used this design extensively because of the weather effects in the North Atlantic, all the fog. That always made engagements in the North Atlantic more likely to happen at closer distances than at further away distances. So a lot of the Atlantic nations used turtleback armor scheme. Japan also used turtleback armor scheme 
for their battleship. So let's go ahead and let's talk about the, the turtleback armor design. And to do that, we are going to go back to Grocer Kerr first, and we are going to show her insides. So you can see here, Grocer Kerr first also has a turtleback armor scheme, but the difference between a protected cruiser and the turtleback design is that we also have an external belt as well, which means that this horizontal fire not only has to penetrate through this belt, but it also has to have enough force to also penetrate the internal sloped deck. In this case, that internal sloped deck on the Grocer Kerr first is 150 millimeters. So we have to penetrate 380 millimeters of belt armor and then penetrate that 150 millimeters of deck, sloped deck armor. And then there's another 45 millimeters there that you have to actually get through as well. So there's a lot of armor protecting the Citadel of a ship with the true turtleback armor scheme. Now the Grocer Kerfurst isn't the only one that has this scheme. If we go down here to the New Mexico, you can see she also has a turtleback armor scheme. Her internal deck is only 51 millimeters. And if we take off this upper portion, you can see that a little bit more clearly. But there's still a lot of belt armor there to protect that Citadel. And the Arizona also has it, and there are a number of other ships that do too. In fact, the Japanese, if you remember, I was talking about how the Atlantic nations were the most frequent users of turtleback armor scheme. Well, the Japanese also used it too, and that's because a large portion of their ship design actually came from the British. The Congo class fast battleships, or battle cruisers when they were originally bought, Congo herself was actually made in Britain and then transported to Japan where they were, you know, reverse engineered the ship to make it herself themselves. And well, I guess reverse engineer is not the right way. They bought the designs for the ship after they bought the ship so that they could make the ship themselves. And that ship also uses a turtleback armor scheme. The Japanese use it extensively in a number of their ships. And of course, you know, one of the most famous ships that uses kind of a weird amalgam of all of these is the Yamato, which definitely has a, a pseudo turtleback scheme going for it there. And this design, you know, it, like I said, it, this takes the, all of the benefits of the uh, protected cruiser design, but it also adds that vertical belt element to it, which makes it even harder to reach the citadels on. Now, the Yamato, she's a little bit easier to citadel than the German battleships, which all have the turtleback armor design. German cruisers also have that design as well. And here's Hindenburg. You can see there's her turtleback. And there is the exterior belt section of it as well. And in terms of outright protection, this is definitely a better way to do it in-game because the game mechanics actually benefit the turtleback armor scheme more than they do anything. The problem with turtleback armor schemes is they are more susceptible to plunging fire. And you can see here on the grosser curve first that if you can get a shell to come down... At about a, let's see, that's the top of that. It'd probably be about a 45 degree angle. You're going to penetrate right through because you're hitting this 150 millimeter sloped deck at a more normal angle, meaning closer to perpendicular, and you're going to penetrate that quite easily without having to deal with all of this belt armor. So there is a downside to it, and that's that long range plunging fire definitely has a higher chance of reaching your citadel which is why this is really good for the close-in engagements. Now, the, the U.S. the U.S. used some very, very advanced deck designs, and that kind of leads us into this next portion, which is multiple decks or one thick one, which is better. Well, there's a lot of theory crafting that's gone around on this, but the U.S. overwhelmingly used multiple decks, and the, the premise of the top deck, the weather deck was to basically arm any shells or any bombs that came through it. Now, in the case of the Missouri game, it's 38 millimeters. That has some other advantages with overmatch mechanics. We won't get into that. But the when a shell actually hits this, it will arm the fuse. And the whole goal of this top deck was to get that shell to explode between it and the actual armored deck, which in this case is 152 millimeters, basically six inches thick. And 
if it didn't detonate right away as it came through there, it would hit this deck and bounce up and then detonate. And this would keep all of the fragments from reaching the vital components of the ship. Yeah, you would have big holes in your deck, but, you know, you wouldn't lose a turret, you wouldn't lose an engine to that shell coming in. Same with bombs. The other thing that that upper weather deck did was it caused the shell to change its angle. As soon as it would hit, it would, it would change its angle due to the friction forces on it as it's passing through the plate. And that actually increased the chances of it bouncing off of this internal belt armor, or, uh, sorry, internal deck armor. And to my knowledge, it, this never was really fully tested, although the South Dakota was kind of sort of tested with this. Kirishima managed to put a shell through through the top deck. We can use the Missouri here. Managed to put a shell through this portion of it. It hit this plate and it came up and it landed and it hit the main barbette which is the big, thick, heavy ring that the turrets sit in. And the shell actually got decapped, meaning the armor-piercing cap that was on the end of it that helps it penetrate armor got pulled off, and then the shell shattered as soon as it hit the, the barbed armor, which was kind of interesting. But overall, this multiple deck design actually ends up working out a lot better for most nations than the one big, thick deck theory did. Now, if we go back to Yamato, you know, Yamato kind of subscribes to the theory of, well, I'd rather just have a, a lot of armor over the vital machinery spaces. And she has a 200 millimeter thick deck and her weather deck is still 57 millimeters. So she's still got a lot of armor and it is designed to, you know, set off shells. But the one thing that Yamato didn't have a whole lot of past that main armor deck was the addition of any splinter protection. Now, all the U.S. ships, and I'm I'm going to struggle to find a good example of this. You can't... That's North Carolina. North Carolina shows it probably the best. So, we've got the main weather deck, 37 millimeters. We've got the main deck up here, which we can't actually see because of the way the armor viewer is, is displayed in this game. And if we come down one deck lower, we've got 43 millimeters of decking over by the magazines and 19 in the middle. This was actually a splinter deck designed to catch any splinters of anything that came through the main armored deck. So the multiple deck stuff, you know, it, it does work and leave it to the U.S. To, to really hone in on these advanced armor designs because the South Dakotas were able to, well, South Dakota herself, I guess I should clarify, South Dakota herself was able to withstand basically point-blank 14-inch shells from Kirishima, a Congo-class battleship. She was about 5,800 yards away from, from South Dakota when she unleashed shells that impacted her side, and those shells that hit the belt armor actually shattered on impact. It didn't cause any damage to the ship aside from just putting holes in the side of it. We didn't get any penetrations through the main armor belt, so the ship remained, with the exception of all the other issues it was having, combat effective. And had the chief engineer not completely screwed the ship and left it without power, it probably would have fared far better in that fight than it did. But the important part is, is it stayed afloat, and then Washington was able to come in and, and you know, save the day. But anyway, those are really the, the most common armor designs that we see in this in this game. Again, you know, it, it, the belt armor is going to be either incremental or all or nothing. The deck armor is either going to be, you know, a protected cruiser, or we're just going to have these multiple layered decks that are horizontal at the top of all of our critical machine spaces, or we're going to have a turtleback armor scheme. If it doesn't have a turtleback armor scheme, again, it's very easy to see the turtleback armor scheme in, in the armor viewer. You can see it quite clearly here with this shape. If it doesn't have that, just assume that your citadel goes all the way to the top of your main armored deck, and that will keep you safe. And as with always, guys, I'm your peacekeeper. Like, comment, subscribe, and thank you for watching.